this uh, evening's lecture uh, was initially planned for last spring as the 18th annual Yudita Stillman Memorial Lecture, uh, only to be rudely interrupted by an ice storm, uh, which I'm sure, if you're not a freshman, uh, or if we were here last year, um, you will remember pretty well. Uh, so uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, the uh, Yadida Stillman Memorial Lecture in the spring, and uh, very, I'm very pleased to say that um, for the, I think the first time uh, we, we've asked one of our own, Pro Professor Luis Cortez, who is here somewhere tonight, um, uh, to deliver it, uh, who, someone who, who knew Yadina and who worked with uh, Noam Stillman, uh, the founder of our program, very, very uh, uh, long and very well. Uh, but a memorial lecture is a memorial lecture. It needs to be near the anniversary of the death of the uh, person, so I, I, in the yard site. So I, I, I can't say that this is the official uh, memorial lecture, uh, but I, I still want to say, in case some of you are graduating in December, uh, let me sneak in uh, 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 a few words, L'Shem Omra, in her honor. Uh, Yadida uh, Stillman was a beloved teacher, a world-renowned scholar uh, who died in 1998. She was born in Morocco, raised in Israel, and Yadida and Noam came here together in the mid-90s uh, to found this program. Uh, they worked together uh, before that for many years at Binghamton University in upstate New York, mid-state New York. Um, Yadida uh, was the author of um, several definitive studies in her field, which is a especially ethnography, folklore, Arabic, uh, Jewish folklore. She was completely at home in Arabic, uh, Hebrew, French. Uh, and uh, uh, she, uh, uh, she uh, wrote several, as I say, several definitive studies, including Arab headdress from the birth of Islam to modern times. Her works are still being read, still being cited, and still being published uh, by her husband, Noam Stillman, uh, who now lives in Jerusalem, uh, but actually was here uh, last year for the memorial lecture. So in the, in the spring, we do a, a fuller celebration. We bring all of Yadida's books and publications and some of her um, uh, very interesting memorabilia. I'm not going to do that tonight. I don't think it's appropriate since then. Uh, it's not a yard site, it's not an anniversary. Very briefly, uh, I want to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Professor James Diamond, who holds the Joseph and Wolf Leibovich Chair of Jewish Studies at the University of Waterloo. Uh, he uh, holds uh, quite a few degrees. Uh, in addition to his BA at the University of Toronto, he has two degrees in, in law. Uh, two in religious studies, uh, and despite 18 years uh, of practicing law as a member of the Ontario Bar, uh, Jim has, uh, starting late, I think that's okay to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. starting late, uh, has published dozens of articles, essays, book chapters uh, in religious studies and philosophy journals uh, and collections, has delivered even more than a few dozen presentations uh, in really all over the world, uh, including, uh, including Israel, and has authored four books, beginning with Maimonides and the Hermeneutics of Concealment, or Jim. Hermeneutics is an H word. We, we try not to use that too much. It was a bad so, move. It was in a bad civil move. company. Uh, and, uh, and more recently, uh, Jewish Theology Unbound, Oxford University Press, 2018. Uh, for those of you old enough to know, you may be interested uh, to find out that uh, uh, he has also published on Leonard Cohn. Uh, for our undergraduates, you may Google Leonard Cohn after, <laughs> after the lecture. Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, okay. So uh, let me just, uh, I could just read you a CV, but that's about the most boring thing you could possibly do to anybody. No, there's one more boring thing. There's one of my articles. <laughs> no, not true. I've read them. They're very, very good. So um, uh, let me ask you to uh, put your cell phones on mute, buckle up for an intellectual voyage, um, share the handouts. The turnout was very good, which means um, we didn't make enough handouts. It's always a guess. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you, can, you share a handout with your neighbor, pass one to the back or to the side so that everybody can follow along. Um, let's say, I don't want to cut into Jim's time, but I will say just a very quick funny thing uh, uh, that happened uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, 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 Professor Diamond uh, came in Tuesday and I teach Wednesday afternoon. I said, Jim, you want to teach my class tomorrow? It's on the commandments. You know more about it than I do. Uh, he, he said, sure. Uh, so he says, Can I, I'll send you something to print off. I said, okay. I thought it was a class handout. It was his own lecture notes, and I looked at it, and of course it was in, almost entirely in Hebrew from about 20 different sources over about 10 different centuries. <laughs> and I, I got nervous. I said, uh, you know, Jim, this class is an introductory class. I, you know, I'm not sure they're going to really follow all this. And uh, he said, no, that was just my notes. That was just for me. That was just really cool. But it was a great class, and I'm sure it's going to be a great lecture. So without further ado, Professor James Diamond. different than the lecture. That is, uh, I'm not even going to talk about do we all, that is, people of different religions that serve the same God. It's a kind of a trite expression that you hear that, from my point of view, is much more complicated than that. Um, and probably, as uh, scholars always ruin everything, probably not true. So that's an easy, uh, an, an easy thing to do, to say that perhaps the God uh, of Christianity and the God of Islam and God of uh, uh, Judaism are different gods. So that, that might be easier than my topic. My topic is, do we Jews all serve the same God? All serve the same God in the name of what we call monotheism. 
So that's what I want to set out to do today, which is, a, I think, a much more interesting question, um, and much more intriguing, at least for me. So the, the problem, if it is a problem for anybody, it might not be a problem for a lot of people <laughs> in the world, but the dilemma or the issue may start with the, 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 the kind of in, interesting, intriguing fact, and this is my first source is under number one, that you can scour the entire Hebrew Bible, which of course is the foundational scripture for Judaism, and you, you will not find a commandment that says, thou shalt believe in God, or thou shalt believe that God exists. There isn't such an assertion, or there isn't such a commandment. So if you find one, let me know. Um, so this, for particularly for Judaism, which is a religion that is driven in a large part, and though I make an argument in my last book that theology is, of course, equally as important, is a religion known uh, as religion deeply entrenched in the law, what do you do with that? What do you do with, you can find all kinds of particular laws, but what about that one, about believing that God exists? So even about that particular law, um, as with everything else, no rabbis unanimously agree on anything, including this, right? including this issue. Whether, in fact, it is a commandment to believe in God, uh, to believe that God exists. Uh, so, so uh, you know, that's not unusual to have arguments. Uh, in fact, I'm the chair of Jewish studies, and I'm the only one in my department. That is, I'm the only one in my university that's in Jewish studies. And when I have meetings with myself, there are still, there are still arguments. So, go figure. Um, in any event, um, my first sources in, in under number one show you that great, prominent, and most of, virtually all of, in honor of um, Yadida, uh, virtually all of them, except for one, because as an Ashkenazi, I have to give a token invitation to one. This is a very important one. All of the figures are from Spain, or thereabouts. So um, the first one was a very early... Uh, figure who was important and uh, lived in about the 8th century, what we call the Gaonic period, Rabbi Shimon Kayara, uh, Babylonia, which is really a, kind of a misnomer, it means kind of somewhere in modern, where modern day Iraq, really actually you may have, in the, in the papers, uh, you may have heard Fallujah, it's probably somewhere around there, but in any event, uh, he was great for maybe one of the first ones to try and systematize and codify what exactly are the laws that everybody thinks there are 613. This is a magic number in Judaism. There are 613 commandments in the Hebrew Bible, that is, scriptural commandments. There are many, many more in rabbinic law, um, which caused me a lot of problems when I was growing up. But anyways, uh, there's 613. But there's an argument about what precisely are those 613, because it's not clear again, if you run through the Hebrew scriptures, that you'll even find 613. And if you do, and you find somebody else who went through the same, you'll find different ones. So this one, this guy, Rabbi Shimon um, Kayara, uh, was the first guy to kind of um, compile these. And he says the following, and you, you can read along in Hebrew, I'm not going to read the Hebrew, but if you know Hebrew, it's there. Only the decrees prohibiting and mandating action, uh, which is, a, this is a, an issue, great issue in rabbinic law, uh, that is things that re require not belief, but action, to do something, are counted in the 613. Whereas belief in God's existence made known to us by signs and miracles, and this is, will play an important part as we go along, and revelation of the Shekhinah, which means the Divine Presence, in front of our eyes. He's referring to Mount Sinai, a foundational event, but apparently um, it was, was a revelation in front of the entire community, not to one particular individual. Is the foundation and principle from which all the commandments are generated and is not counted. So, it's a kind of a, a general, right, um, a general belief that pervades all commandments. Obviously, Whenever you perform a commandment, it's assumed that there's a commander, right? Otherwise, why would you perform that commandment? So every commandment on its own, once performed, 
already assumes that belief, but it's not counted as a separate commandment. Um, Maimonides, on, on the other hand, who was um, who's my favorite guy, um, I, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating uh, to say that he is the most important Jewish thinker um, in both philosophy and theology and law um, since the Middle Ages. Uh, and the reason he is so important is that he mastered and became the most prominent person in both those fields. If he had just mastered philosophy, we have lots of those guys, those guys can be dismissed in the general, I would say, rabbinic world. Maimonides is a hard guy to, to, to dismiss because he mastered rabbinic law. Because he mastered rabbinic law. That's an important thing, I think, to remember. But anyways, for him, because for, for him, the world of thought, the world of the intellect, is the most important facet, dimension of the human being, it cannot be that a belief that is so important that takes place in the mind is not a commandment. That's where he's coming from. That's where he's coming from. And he counts it right away at the start of his code. So he really was the first guy to, and, and we're talking very late, at least in my sense of history, very late in Jewish history. We're talking um, uh, 11th, 12th century. You don't have a code, a systematic code of Jewish law where I can go, let's say, find out about the laws of Sabbath, and go to a place called the laws of Sabbath. Because if you go to the Talmud and look at the tractate called Sabbath, you won't know where you're going, you won't know where to find uh, the issue you're looking for, and you'll find all kinds of other things. All kinds of other things. So he, being a, what's called kind of the father of Jewish rationalism, being a rationalist, being a, having a juristic mind, being a scientist, couldn't stand the mess. Couldn't stand the mess, so he, he, he fixed it up, and he organized it into a code. And he starts right off the bat with this issue. You saw, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll read it in English, foundation of all foundations and pillar of all sciences is to know, this is important, to know, it's important that he uses that word, not to believe, that there is a primary being a primary, primary being. Knowledge of this is a positive commandment. So he lists it in his 613 as opposed to the previous guy I was talking about. And he knew about that too. So he's taking, taking issue with this precedent. Um, as it states, and then of course he goes to what many people think that believing in God would be found. Where it would be found, which is in the Ten Commandments. But you won't find it there. So where does he find it? He says, as it states, Anochi Hashem Elokim. I am God, your God. But curious, right? Because uh, in Jewish law, at least for Maimonides, the first of the Ten Commandments is a statement. It's not a thou shalt, like the others. Right? It's a statement. It's what we call in law. So mom, thanks, law did come in handy in some places. Um, a preamble, right? A preamble to a statute that kind of, you know, just talks about what the rationale is for this. Um, uh, this uh, establishes the authority of the person who's demanding the, this list of commandments. But Maimonides says that that's where you find the basis for this law. I am God, you're God. Okay. The second, this is 1C, the second I feel in my estimation, in my humble estimation, um, second greatest figure um, in the Middle Ages, um, alongside Maimonides, very, very different in mindset, um, was, was one of the earlier Kabbalists, uh, one of the great commentators, great, great Talmudic scholars, also born uh, and, and, and lived in Girona, a guy named Ramban, with us the acronym, Moses, the son of Nachman, Nachmanides, not Maimonides, Nachmanides. 
Um, and he spent a lot of time actually taking issue with Maimonides. He lived after Maimonides, a little bit after. But he agrees. He says, this is a mitzvah, a commandment. But this is what's important, uh, and I'll try to flesh this out a bit on the question of do we all believe in the same God. This is a mitzvah, a commandment. Bringing them out of Egypt, why is it a mitzvah? Because the rest of the verse, so this is important. Maimonides quotes the first half of the verse. I am God, your God. For a reason, and I think intentionally, he does not quote the second half of the verse, which Nachmanides concentrates on, the one about, I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt, out of the house, the, the place of bondage. Bringing them out of Egypt proves divine existence and will. For with his knowledge and providence, we went out. And it also proves creation, because if the world was eternal, nature would never change. Meaning, if the world was eternal, miracles wouldn't be possible, because there wouldn't be anybody that started the ball rolling, there wouldn't be anybody that actually has authority over the creation. So how could nature change? And of course, the money take that, takes that for granted, that there were miracles, um, and that proves his power, and the power proves his unity. So here's the beginning of the crux of the issue of where Jews and two, again, of the most prominent thinkers in medieval Judaism that continue, I think, to influence, continue to influence, certainly rabbinic Judaism to this day, very, very different models of who that God is, and I'll try to, as I said, uh, expand on that. And then I just threw in another guy who's a very interesting guy, um, that's 1D, Abraham Ibn Ezra, some of you might know that guy, very, very prominent um, uh, interpreter um, of the Bible, also, uh, and there I have, lived, you have Jerome in Egypt, he lived all over the place. Right? So he was peripatetic, a very interesting life, started off in Spain because of persecutions um, in Spain um, from Islam. Uh, he went to North Africa, became friends with one of the other guys I'm going to talk about, um, and had a discussion with Yehuda Levi, which is a, another great medieval figure that he actually records a discussion on this commandment in his commentary. Um, even went went from Spain, went went to France, even went to, went as far as England, actually, in the 12th century. Um, as far as we know, ended up dying back in Spain. He also says, and, and he, he poses a lot of problems with the Ten Commandments. What are they? What are the Ten? But he raises this question, Anochi, that first verse, is neither a positive nor a negative commandment. I don't know what to do with this. And then he goes on to elaborate on it. But he points out the problem. So, um, number two, um, are a couple of sources that also raise the issue about do we all say, say, uh, serve the same God, that these ancient or uh, 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 very old sources address is who is this God that's appearing to us now at Mount Sinai? Um, why does he say I am God, your God. What do you mean? The Jews, the Israelites, at the bottom of the mountain, this voice comes out, all the thunder and the lightning, and he has to say, hey guys, I'm God. Why does he have to do that? Right? So this sets the rabbinic mind working. Um, and so in, in, a, in a midrashic, this is kind of an a, a ancient um, collection, a collection that uh, was edited later, but certainly of ancient sources, since God appeared, uh, uh, tries to explain this first kind of preamble, or this first assertion, since God appears to them in many different forms, at the sea, when he split the sea, or really the plagues, like a warrior. Um, at Sinai, like a scribe, teaching Torah. Um, in Daniel's time, meaning the prophet, uh, the book of Dan Daniel, like an old man. In Solomon's, like a young man. God says... Don't be misled by the fact that you perceive me in many different forms. I'm the one at the sea. I'm the one at Sinai. I'm, I'm the Lord your God. Very interesting because it, it hones in really on a problem 
uh, that it sees that's a problem with paganism or a problem with polytheism, right? The polytheism addresses this very problem. Well, hey, hey, I see many, many different forces, um, natural phenomena in the world, um, and they seem to indicate a very fragmented world. There must be different powers that control all these things. So this Midrash hones in on that, and they use this first verse to say that's, this verse is solving that problem. You thought before that these were all attributed to different powers. I'm telling you now, I'm the guy that controls them all. I'm the guy that controls them all. So here's the Ashkenazi guy, 2B. So um, the token Ashkenazi guy, Rashi, um, who I don't think anybody doing Jewish law or Jewish theology can ever do without. Um, one of the great commentators. Uh, lived a bit earlier than Maimonides, 1040 to 1105. It's amazing how much you can do in 25 minutes in your life. Okay. Um, so uh, he said on this verse, his comment, since I change in appearance, again picking up on this, do not think there are two powers. Another explanation is do not think there are many powers, since at the very, at the, at the very sight, Sound is coming from any, everywhere. Do not think there are many powers, since there are sounds from all directions. I'm the source of them all. It's very interesting, and that could be the subject of an entire different lecture, but it's, but it's interesting that they pick up on this problem that they know is around in the ancient world um, about uh, on how polytheism, how different powers are generated based on a view of natural phenomena. So now I want to get, so that's, this is where kind of the problem already starts. There's a dilemma. Um, and because you don't really have a strict command, and because you already have an argument, if we even say that, you, that we have a God, that Jews have a God to believe in, what is the nature of that God? Who is that God? How does he operate? What's his essence? So on this, you have a very, very essential debate that I think, and I've had this argument even with my wife, she can't take it, but she, the, that these lead to not different conceptions of God. So here's a philosophical problem, not different conceptions of God, but different gods, different gods. So let's start with Maimonides. Uh, who in his code says the following, and this is verse 3. God's unity, so he's explaining the oneness of God, is absolutely unique, unlike anything, any one thing in the world. So he starts off by saying, the oneness doesn't mean there's lots of things that are one in the world. There is only one, thank goodness, James Diamond. Right? That's not the sense of the one God. That's not the sense. It's not simply the sense of number. Uh, in his principles, and this is why this is so important, because the only guy, the only guy to give Judaism dogma, so there are, I'm sure, Christians in the audience that are familiar with dogma, and that might find it peculiar <coughs> that Judaism, up until the 12th century, does not have, really, any kind of systematic dogma. Any list of dogmas that Jews... It only comes into being with Maimonides, which is very interesting. And that's why this problem that I'm going to talk about, that I'm talking about, becomes a much more difficult problem, because he's the guy that actually develops the theology that most Orthodox Jews, at least, subscribe to, at least pay lip service to, pay lip service to. One of the things, just as an aside, I find interesting, because you would think, let's take a rabbinic Jew, um, you would think that if there, these are the famous Maimonides, Maimonides developed 13 principles, 13 principles that all have to do with belief, not action that a Jew must believe in, 
And Maimonides goes as far to say that if a Jew does not believe in these principles, he's not a Jew. He's not a Jew. As far as I know, most rabbis would simply say, just like I'm a lawyer, because if you have a Jewish mother, you're a Jew. That's it. Finished. End of day. End of story. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to believe in anything. And you can never leave the club. You can never leave the club. You know, there's that famous, and I always remember in Godfather 3, Al Pacino <laughs> saying, you can never leave once you're in. You can never leave. That's the mafia. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so, so, um, so he says, in his 13 principles, the first three are to believe in God's existence, to believe in God's unity, and to believe in his incorporeality. That is, God doesn't have anything that we consider, or that are physical characteristics. Or even, not even physical characteristics. So this is what he says in his work, which is the, the other masterpiece, aside for his, aside his code of law, which is called the Mishnah Torah, which even that was controversial, um, which is kind of a, 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 a second Torah, a tradition of the Torah, people didn't like that, so they referred to it as the 14 volumes. <laughs> they didn't even like that. Um, but in his Guide of the Perplexed, which is not that well known in the rabbinic world for reasons that may become obvious um, as I go along, there cannot be any belief in the unity of God except by admitting that he is one simple substance without any composition or plurality of elements, one from whatever side you view it, by whatever test you examine it, not divisible into two parts in any way and by any cause. Okay, so um, this is a very, very um, sophisticated, complex statement. But as I will show, um, he goes so far to say that to, to, to believe in one God is not just to believe that he doesn't have any physical characteristics, but not even any characteristics at all. Not kind, not compassionate, not all those things that we associate with God. To do that is to, to, to basically enact basically think of him as a human being, that causes all kinds of problems because human beings can be compassionate at one moment, can be angry at another moment, can be unkind at another moment. It leads to change. God never changes. I'm, I'm really telescoping. <laughs> Thousands of pages of scholarly articles into a kind of just a couple of sentences. But for him even to say that God has attributes or characteristics is already to fragment the oneness of God. So now let's take a look at another guy. I just picked one guy, Italian, in the 13th century, um, who was Kabbalistic. And so this is, um, this is uh, two on the other side, a little two on the other side of the page. Um, and Kabbalah um, generally has a belief in this kind of system, which is uh, another long discussion. But it's a belief that God, or the Godhead, or the being of God, can be divided into ten different, they call it spirot, ten different dimensions, um, ten different aspects, whatever you want to call them. Here's a statement from one, but there are like, hundreds. Even though there are ten, and, and they're, they're always conscious, that's why I picked this statement, whenever Kabbalists talk about the ten dimensions of God, they're always conscious of this problem, this Maimonidean problem. Oh, wait a second, I don't really mean ten. I don't mean ten. He's one, but I mean ten. But he's one, but I mean ten. But he's really one. Okay, so this is, this is an example. Even though there are ten spirits, there is one who controls all of them. There is one spirit to all of them. Just like the human soul is indivisible and yet controls all the limbs. Right? So I guess we would say the brain. Um, some say anochi. So then he goes into the splitting it up into back to this verse, um, this first verse in the Ten Commandments, Anochi the first. So he splits it up the way Kabbalists do. Each word, I, is one word, and God is another word, your God is another word. We already refer to the different dimensions of God that become the staple of Kabbalistic theology. Now, I go back to my monitor. 
And then you tell me. So this also is from the God of the perplexed. Those who believe that God is one and that he has many attributes, and don't forget, Maimonides didn't know about Rekhanati, um, Kabbalistic concepts I'm sure were floating around, were floating around, and I'm sure that he was doing battle against nascent uh, concepts like this. Uh, and perhaps this is directed at some of those kind of beginnings of that kind of idea. But anyone who believes that he has many attributes declare with the unity with their lips. They pay lip service to the oneness of God and assume plurality in their thoughts. So now I'm going to beg your forgiveness from many of the Christians in the audience. But there was serious polemics and serious debates. And of course, Maimonides could say this openly about Christianity because it's often a function. What you can say out loud is often a function of where you live. So Maimonides lived in an Islamic culture, under Islamic rule. Uh, when he talked about Islam, it's a bit more reticent. Um, this is like the doctrine of the Christians, who say that he is one and he is three, and that the three are one, which is a problem in Christianity as well, among Christian theologians, who have dealt with this problem as well. It wasn't, this is not like something that Maimonides is making up. Uh, of the same character is the doctrine of those who say that God is one, but that he has many attributes. And that he, that he, with his attributes, is one. Although they deny physicality, corporeality. So, I would say here, on this score, Maimonides would turn to Rekhanati and all the capitalists and say, you not, don't have a different concept of God. You have a different God. Not only do you have a different God, but your God is worse than that. Because if your God is not a one God, and he's a fragmented God, or a God that consists of different dimensions, you're worshipping idolatry. Idolatry. I, I don't think it's uh, absolute exaggeration to say that Maimonides would say, you are an idolater. I may be a bit, bit more polite uh, when we get a little bit further. There's another option but it's not too much better. Here's another, another guy in source little four, just threw him in to show who picks up on Maimonides, was a very, very great Talmudist, Akbar um, Sheshit <coughs> Parvet in Spain, also interesting, fascinating life. Um, all we have from him is a collection of halachic, of legal responsa, but in there, he didn't like Kabbalists too much either. He didn't have it. Uh, he, did, he didn't have a lot of love for philosophers, but kind of, he tolerated them. But he said this about the, the, the capitalists. The Gentiles, obviously referring to Christians, are believers in a trinity. The capitalists are worse. They're believers in, I made up this word, because I, I don't know what the word would be. Uh, if anybody can help me with that word, uh, I, I started off with tenity, but you know, I saw decade, a decade. So he says, you guys, is that the word I suppose? Right? So, 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 um, you guys are worse. You're worse than the Christians. That's a pretty bad thing. <laughs> right? Um, so, so, here's where I get to the point where, where I, I, I believe that, that, again, you know, we can have these arguments um, about are they different conceptions of God. But my mind is the same. This is not a different conception of the same God. It's a different God. It's a different God. Or... Maybe it's even better than idolatry. It's a being that doesn't exist. And I'll, 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 I'll uh, show that a little bit uh, more explicitly later on. Now, Yudha Levi, which is my next source, um, who's very, very, also very, very prominent, uh, famous poet, Spanish, lived uh, a little bit um, before Maimonides. They overlap a bit. It's not clear. Maimonides never mentions him. It's hard to believe that Lamonis wouldn't have known of him because he was in Egypt as well. Um, maybe he doesn't mention him because he doesn't like him, or, or he wasn't really as prominent uh, or prominent guy enough for him. But what's interesting about uh, Judah Levy goes back to what I, uh, something I mentioned before, which is I think Judah Levy um, is, in, in many circles, very important. It's called the world very important. Poetry wrote a very fam famous tract called the Kuzari, which is a kind of a, um, also... Um, philosophical uh, debate, um, 
trying to convince somebody about the truth of Judaism. But I have to say that in rabbinic Judaism, not really a big guy. Somebody, some people might think this is offensive, but I think that's true. He's not really a big guy. Um, you talk to maybe rabbinic students today, maybe that's not a great indication, um, they'll all know Maimonides. Not one single rabbinic student today, anywhere in the world, sitting in any rabbinic academy, will not know the name of Maimonides. Um, and if he doesn't, then he would have been expelled. Right? Uh, I can tell you that many of them will not know the name of Judah Levy, and if they do know his name, they will not have it. They will never have read anything of his. And the reason is, going back to what I said before, because Judah Levy did not make his mark also in halacha, in the legal world. That is, Judah Levy never became known as a master of rabbinic law. So kind of, you know, in, in the rabbinic world, I can take him or leave him. Right? He's okay. Maybe he's a good poet. I don't know. Wrote a nice little book. But, you know, in the classroom in the rabbinic academy, it's my modern that you got to deal with all the time. All the time. All the time. So he says the following, which is again very different on what proves the existence of God. Remember that Maimonides simply said, quotes the first part of the verse, I am God, you're God, because Maimonides thinks that the way you know, and he says the commandment is to know that God exists, is intellectual knowledge. You reason your way towards the existence of God. And medievals had many arguments. Nowadays those are iffy. Okay, but let's take them you know, in his context. Um, very, very different arguments, similar also arguments in Christian in the Christian world, proving that God exists. Maimonides thinks that that's the way you do it. That's the way you do it. Judah Levi, it concentrates, like Nachmanides, on the second half of the verse. Moses, the Pharaoh, when he told him, the God of the Hebrews sent me to thee, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for Abraham was well known to the nations who also knew that the divine spirit was in contact with the patriarchs. He did not say, so this is what Judah Levi says. He did not introduce himself at Mount Sinai in that verse. I am God, your God, who created the world. He says, I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt. So Judah Levi says, that's important. He didn't say creator. In the same way God commenced his speech to assemble people of Israel, I am the God whom you worship, who has led you out of the land of Egypt. He did not say I am the creator of the world. Now in the same style, I speak to you. This is where the Jewish guy is speaking to a Gentile, let's say. When, now, when you asked me about my belief, I answered you, and fitting that the whole of Israel who knew, knew these things from personal experience and afterwards through uninterrupted tradition, which is equal to the former. For Judah Levi, what proves God's existence is first and foremost personal experience. Very, very different idea of God that is an experiential um, feeling of God, an experiential belief in, grounded in experience, and then an uninterrupted tradition. That is, those who were at Mount Sinai handed that experience down to their children and all the way down to my parents and to me. Um, and that's what proves, and that's why he doesn't say, I am God who created the world. Because that requires you to do what Maimonides wants you to do. Because if I am the God who created the world, Nobody was there, right? as far as I know, as far as the Bible tells us, nobody was there during those six days before he created Adam and Eve to witness that. So there's no personal experience of that. So how would you know that? right? So for Maimonides, you can reason your way to a creator. And that's why for him, the second half of the verse, he, as far as I know, never quotes. Never quotes. Because for that, for him, is a problem. Because personal experience is faulty, tradition might be faulty, that is, people, I, I, I can't rely on what you tell me. For Maimonides, Maimonides says clearly in very many places, and maybe some, a lot of your professors will tell you that too, I want you to set aside whatever anybody told you, right? Because in this class, 
I want you to work your way towards this proposition, whatever it is they're teaching, on your own. On your own. And that's the only way you can know something for my monitor. The only way you can truly know something is not because your mother told you, or your father told you, or somebody even in a position of authority told you, or even Professor Levinson told you. I, I, you know, I mean, maybe that's an exception. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, um, but for my modern, it can only be certain if you, if you know it, and the only way you can know it is to read it. <coughs> And then um, I have a conversation that Abraham Ibn Ezra had with Judah Levy. Some people actually say that Judah Levy was his father-in-law, I don't know. But they, they knew each other, and he actually talks about this conversation. And Ibn Ezra tries to, Ibn Ezra, the great compromiser, puts the two together. He says, yeah, 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 okay, okay, Judah Levy. But God is saying both for different audiences. That's what he's doing. He's saying, I'm God, you're God, for the Maimonidean God. For the sophisticated elite who can do that. For the intellectuals who can do that. But he's also saying, for the other guys, right, not to put them down, who, who deal, who aren't, let's say, intellectually sophisticated, but can experience things, there's this other half of the verse. So they're speaking to different audiences, and it's a very inclusive thing. Very nice. Very nice. But Maimonides doesn't go for that. Doesn't go for that. So, um, so let me let me just because uh, I, I think I'm I, I'm not sure how much longer ten minutes okay so um, I, I just wanted to show you that last source on that page uh, that you have Maimonides uh, in his guide it says it says quite an unbelievable thing that I, I think most rabbinic Jews today would find um, really surprising. Um, and difficult. He picks up on a very, very ancient rabbinic tradition um, where the first two commandments were heard by all of Israel. The first two, that is, I am God your God, take that as the first one, and thou shalt not have any other gods before me. So, if we take that in simple language, God's existence, and the second one is God's unity, for my mind. Those are the two. Those all of Israel heard, and this is a rabbinic, a rabbinic um, uh, midrash, a rabbinic uh, tradition. The rest were um, spoken by Moses, recorded by Moses. He kind of conveyed that as an intermediary. So what Maimonides takes this and spins it into a really super rationalist explanation. The Israelites heard the first and the second commandments of God. They learned the truth of these principles contained in these two commandments, that is, existence of God and unity of God, in the same manner as Moses and not through Moses. Why? For these two principles, the existence of God and his unity, can be arrived at by means of reasoning. And since all human beings, not just Moses, have brains, and all human beings can, if they exert themselves to one extent or another, reason their way towards truths. They can all do this. And they all did this. That's how he takes this ancient rabbinic tradition, which I guarantee you no friend of mine that I grew up with, many of them are still in the rabbinic world, would take it this way. Right? Um, and whatever can be established by proof is known by the prophet in the same way as any other person. These two principles were not known through prophecy alone. The rest of the commandments, he thinks, are not what we call in philosophy, not universal principles. Philosophy deals with universals. Things that are applied all over, not just to Jews, not just to Christians. They're not subjective, they're not temporal, they're not historical. Philosophers deal with that, those kinds of problems. And he says the rest of the commandments, if you look at them, they don't deal with universal principles. So that you needed the prophet, actually, for an inferior uh, uh, kind of knowledge, um, which is ethical knowledge. For him, that was an inferior kind of knowledge. Keep the Sabbath. I mean, you know, some people can keep it. Some people don't have to keep it. It's kind of uh, Jew-specific, um, you know, according to Maimonides. Um, Gentiles don't have to keep the Sabbath. They can be perfectly good people without keeping the Sabbath. Even things like that are universally accepted. Well, I actually can 
considering what's going on in the world. Maybe not universally accepted. Maybe not in everything. But not to kill. Not to steal. Right? Um, those things uh, are, you, are hard put in philosophy. There's tremendous debate um, about whether those things are absolute truths. <coughs> but he doesn't consider those. Right? He considers those kind of changing, temporal, subjective. But the first two are absolute truths, the subject of philosophy, and then everybody, what he does is, he changes Mount Sinai into a philosophical class. That is, all the people, the Israelites that stood at the foot of the mountain, including Moses, went to a philosophy course and reasoned their way towards the existence of the unity of God. And that's the only way they established the truth of those principles in their mind. Um, so I, I'm just going to end with, uh, if you go to the next page, uh, divine names. Um, and just I'll take one. Um, to show the difference between what I think are different gods, um, Judah Lady. So you know, uh, uh, a lot of you might know, um, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, this is the unfortunate thing, so all of you who want to master uh, the Hebrew Bible, um, you know, what's, what's always translated by one word really can be translated by many words, which is the word for God. So the word for God has many, many different names in the Bible, and in translations it's hard to translate that. So, um, Yahweh, Elohim, uh, Shaddai, all kinds, Ale, right? So, but these are hard to notice in translation. So all of you who want to go forward and read the Bible, go learn Hebrew. But, um, so there are different names, and of course that exercised Jews. What are these different names? Isn't the same God? Uh, so that, that this could be, a, again, we'll invite you back to another lecture about the different names of God. But, Judah Levi, let's take the word, uh, the, uh, the Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton, uh, which is the four-letter um, in Hebrew, uh, Yahweh, um, a, a, the tetragram. This is a proper noun, he says, Judah Levi, which can only be indicated by attributes, by attributes. Just as if one would say a proper name as Reuben or Sim, Simon, Simeon, Shimon, supposing that these names indicate their personalities. So for, for Judah Levi, the Tetragrammaton, which is the most revered name, kind of names God. You, you know by this name, um, it, 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 all the associations, the attributes, all the characteristics, compassionate, kind, um, right, holy, all these things that we generally associate with God, that, that, that name can capture. Now listen to Maimonides. Pours rain on the parade, as always. It's not an appellative. It does not denote any attribute of God, nor does it imply anything except his existence. So to say God is Yahweh is, for Maimonides, a tautology, what we call in philosophy a tautology. It's simply to say God is God. For Judah Levi, it's to identify God by all the attributes that one associates with God. So, same God, different gods, if I can, um, I, Rashi, the token Ashkenazi, when he goes to that famous I will be, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be, famous, uh, famous address to Moses at the burning bush, this of course, I looked up a biblically on this, which is in Hebrew, Ayyam, Ashir Ayyam. There are thousands of <laughs> articles on what this means, on what this means. I will be who I will be. I think it means I will be who I will be. Um, and Rashi takes it in a very interesting way. Again, experiential, very, very different minorities. And this is the, the root, right? This is where the name Yahweh comes from. It's to be, right? It's simply to be. I will be with them in this crisis. That's what he says to Moses, because he's addressing Moses, who's about to leave. He's about to commission Moses to liberate the Jews, and he says, I will be with them in this crisis as I will be with them in future oppressive times. That's what I will be, who I will be is. I am the God, and all those things we associate, the God of compassion, I will be the God who will always be with you. I'm there for you, right? I will appear here, I will intervene in history there. For Maimonides, that's not this God. This God does not intervene in history, 
God does not have attributes. God simply is. He simply is. Um, so I'm going to end with, uh, so I've had this debate again uh, with my wife quite a bit and my kids. And she doesn't like me talking to my kids about this. <laughs> um, they were raised in, in Jewish schools, Orthodox Jewish schools. Um, but I think it's an important thing because, it, it, you know, I think one has to think about the type of God one worships, uh, especially if one spends a lot of time in their lives doing that. Um, uh, you know, you, you figure, well, what kind of God is this? Uh, different conceptions of God or different gods. So I think my mind have a, has a pretty explicit statement on this score. So that's what I'll end with. And this is that last source. In my mind, I call this Rashi's or Nachmanides or a lady's God exists. And this is what he said. Someone has heard of the elephant, and he knows that it is an animal. But he's asking, he wants me to tell him, what's an elephant? Tell me about the elephant. A person who is either misled or misleading tells him, I want to lie to him, tells him, you know, it's, it's an animal with one leg, three wings, lives in the sea, has a transparent body, its face is wide like that of a man, has the same form and shape, speaks like a man, flies in the air, sometimes swings like a fish. I should not say that he described the elephant incorrectly. If he's addressing this exact question. Is this a different conception of an elephant? Is, is he talking about a different idea of an elephant? An incorrect description of an elephant? Or that he has an insufficient knowledge of the elephant, but I would say that the thing described is an invention, a fiction, and that in reality there exists nothing like it. It's like these mythic beings, like a centaur and a griffin. Similarly imaginary com combinations for which simple and compound names have been borrowed. The present case is analogous. Namely, God exists, has existence has been proved to be absolute, if such a simple, absolutely existing, <coughs> existing essence were said to have attributes like Haleli, like Rashi, like Nachmanides, like all the capitalists, like all the movements since then, the Hasidic movement, which is the kind of modern, uh, popular capitalistic movement, then it would in no way be an existing thing. So he's a little bit more gracious, rather than saying they're idolaters, he's saying they're worshipping nothing. This being that they believe they're worshipping doesn't exist. So I suppose when they're praying, their prayers, according to Maimonides, are not going anywhere. They're going to a fictitious being. So I, I, uh, I make this personal and I, I say, you know, um, I tend to say to my children, to the people, you know, if I tell you, you know who I am, you know me, and, and you know, and, and somebody comes up to you, this is a good different than my mother, and somebody comes up to you and I'm not there, and says, you know, I just saw Jim Diamond, right? And he's 7'3", seven 7'3", three, seven three, right? He's the most handsome guy in the world. Um, he's got six wives. He's the greatest tennis player in the world. I'm a pretty good tennis player. Um, <laughs> So uh, the guy who knows me, would he say that that's a different conception of James Diamond? Or is he talking about some other James Diamond? Or a James Diamond that doesn't exist? So, um, so I'll leave it there, um, and uh, I guess we have some time for questions. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, first of all, I'm Taylor. Taylor. Um, that was really fun to talk. Um, so, I've never heard it described as fun. But oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I hear sometimes um, when I talk to some of my Christian friends about their beliefs, uh, and when it gets into sort of the nitpicky details of the nature of God, a lot of the times it comes down to something like, well, God is like some, el like by essence or by nature, God is necessarily beyond our capacity to right. understand. Right. So that's when sort of, in their view, belief comes in to sort of bridge the gap of what they can reasonably know and what they believe in nonetheless. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, there are any sort of common or popular strains of Judaism that think in that same way. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for instance, let's say in both traditions, in the rationalist tradition, the capitalist, the capitalist tradition, certainly always, they claim to know a lot about God, but they'll always tell you there is this aspect of God, I'm not going to get into all the particulars, but for instance, in this dimension of the dimension of God, there is this real essential aspect that one can never get to, or that, that is beyond. So, so what they've done is, and, 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 and many of these kind of theologies, I, th I think what lies behind is we want to give you something you can hold on to. Uh, you can influence, let's say, you can impact, you can talk to, and so they have these different dimensions um, that are active, that are interactive, but they always make it very clear that there is, of course, the essence of God is beyond. And Maimonides also will say, in fact, I think what Maimonides would say is the following. That is, I can never tell you what God is. And he's kind of famous for this. I can only tell you what God isn't. What God isn't. So he's famous um, in, in kind of uh, um, medieval theology, medieval philosophy, um, in, in Judaism for neg what they call negative theology. Right? And he spends a lot of time doing that. But he says that the more I say, the more I uh, dismiss things, the closer you get perhaps what that being is. But I have to get to the point where I can dismiss every single thing that I know, and then I still will get to the thing I don't know, but at least I'll know that I don't know. So, so I, think, I think what he would say is that one has to spend, it's, it's fine for people to say, I don't know. Um, but most ignorant people will say that. For him to really say, I don't know God, Perhaps that's the pinnacle of religious life. But to say, to lead your whole life to the point where you truly understand that I don't know God. So, so yes, absolutely, there's very uh, emphatically in, in a lot of different strains, uh, there is this idea that God is beyond uh, human capacity. In the world in which this conversation took place, the medieval Jewish world, the medieval Jewish Christian world, was there anybody who didn't believe in God? Were any of these arguments intended to convince uh, the general population of atheists that they were wrong and that God exists? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, the word atheism uh, is a very modern word. I think I think when you talk to medievals, that wasn't really an option. Um, it, 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 it's not like you had documents around then. <laughs> uh, I should have said that for <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you did have Aristotle. So, so there was a, a, the the most you could do is uh, you know even Aristotle believed in a fine mover, uh, but not a not a god to the world. So, so Aristotle, these guys were dealing, if they were dealing with anybody, it would be Aristotle. Aristotle, let's say play loosely, would be the, would be the Richard Dawkins that they would have to contend with. And Maimonides always contends with Aristotle, right? Um, on creation, because Aristotle believed the world was eternal, um, so he takes him on on that. So I would say, but to, 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 to project like these kind of, ideas of atheism in that world, uh, I would say no, that wouldn't be what the debate is about. The debate is about God is there, what kind of a God is that? And for Maimonides, actually it turns out that these guys are atheists. <laughs> but, but, but if you told them that, they would, they would probably kill you, right? Uh, uh, ideas meant a lot in those days. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my answer. Right? You know, uh, I was saying, uh, actually I was discussing this with Alan, uh, it turns out that uh, you know, many of the leading um, neo atheists today, if you can take a study, are Jewish, actually. <laughs> interesting, very interesting. Um, and so Christopher Hitchens himself found out later on in life that he was Jewish. He found out that his mother was Jewish. Um, and he, he said, you know, there must be an atheist gene among Jews. But he said, you know, it's interesting because the Jews almost had it right. They cut it down to one. You just have to go a little bit further. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. There have been, as you know, 
people who have argued for a long time, people who have written about Maimonides, who have accused me, being me, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> how, would you, yeah, how, how would you contextualize that in terms of this? So, so you know, when, when we get to, um, to, to modern times or modern scholarship, um, looking at like modern day, picking up on this idea of negative theology, um, there are people who claim that um, Maimonides was kind of a closet. I can't use that word a kind of a closet, you know, um, philosopher who who did not really believe in all the traditional notions of God and time, and he's playing a real game. Now, this is the problem with the book, right? This problem with the book is that, let's say, for instance, um, I think we were talking about this the other day, um, on the issue, the way he writes this book is he's cognizant of this kind of he probably he already knows that um, this kind of thing is going to come up. Maybe not atheist in that technical sense, but he already knows, and he and he talks about this. Right? He says he says at the beginning of his guide, he says that I know this is going to get me in hot water. Not those words, right? for different words for hot water. Um, I know this is going to get me in hot water because I'm, I I, virtu I know I'm virtually going to, going to challenge every single notion that is traditionally held. But he says the following. He says, I am the one, I lie with this little sentence, I am the one who would rather offend 10,000 ignoramuses than withhold the truth from one worthy human being. <laughs> so so um, I'm not sure I answered your question because it's a long discussion. But um, again, my Maimonides himself, I don't think he would have thought in those terms. And I don't agree. I, I actually am not a side that doesn't agree with that. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting position. Sorry? They, yeah, actually, at, at the time. I don't know if anybody accused him of being an atheist. Um, you know, a, 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 an Epicurean, let's say, or a heretic. Uh, it turned out, right, that this, uh, after Maimonides lived, uh, there was a hundred years of fierce debate, controversy, that actually ended up, as, as Professor Shapkaru uh, mentioned, in the burning of his books. Um, and to this day, um, you have fierce debates. So the usual thing that I encounter is um, <clears throat> is where people um, take the guy, let's say, rabbinical orthodox, um, and they're simply they'll, they'll what we call in that world darshan. They'll they'll midrashly rabbinic rabbinic, um, um, rabbinic strategies have developed have developed strategies to to the utmost efficiency in, you know, strangling sentences uh, to mean what they want them to mean. Uh, in this case, they do that with the guy that perplexed if they have to. Um, if I can mention one, one, one personal experience that I had, which I think catches a lot of this. I grew up, uh, you know, I went to rabbinic schools, and we were very orthodox rabbinic schools, and I still have a lot of friends. My friends um, one guy in particular was the best friends with him. He became a uh, chassid, uh, like a real full-fledged chassid. Um, we hadn't talked in a long time, not because we just moved, to, we moved away to Flat to Borough Park in New York. Um, and but he was he we took classes together. So he was unusual in the fact that he was literate. We actually took philosophy classes together in university, and so he edited the Orthodox newspaper, the Haredi. Barry, the ultra-Orthodox newspaper in Toronto. So one, one time, I would read his editorials, and he wrote, uh, may we all be privileged to reach the stage that Maimonides says that all Jews can reach, um, like the Levites, who totally dedicate themselves to God. Now, Maimonides actually doesn't say that. Okay. Maimonides says, Every, in his code of law, he says every single human being in the world can achieve the highest state possible if they follow the model of the Levites, the Levites who were totally dedicated to priests. And he says explicitly, but in, in his mind, right, he just saw Jew, right, because he didn't see the universe, universal aspect. So I saw him and I said, you know, Sam is his name. Called Sam, but they're called Rabbi. <laughs> right. 
doesn't say that. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you mean, you mean everybody can reach? I said, you know, I don't know for sure, but that's not, he says, yeah. So, so, so he said, well, let's go. So we opened up the book. The books are there, right? There's no synagogue or rabbinic canyon that won't have my modern books. They might not have the guy that collects them. They'll all have the code. Um, and we looked, and, you know, and he sees this expression, which doesn't say Jews. It says, everybody, I'll loosely, who has entered the world, has entered the world. He still wouldn't accept it. So he's got, no, entered the world means like this now. I said, forget it. Forget it, right? This expression, I've already looked it up. Even when the rabbis use it, it's, it's not used particularistically. So, so we had this huge argument, and he like stomped off. He was really angry, right? Um, anyways, months later, I met him, and he said, he said, and this has relevance to the talk. He said, you know, you're right. He took a lot out of this guy. You're right. And he did a lot of things. You're right, but we don't hold. This is the word that he used. We don't hold like my mind. We hold like not my <laughs> So that, that's, the, that's the answer, right? Um, I, I think maybe we should thank uh, uh, Professor Diamond and give one of